Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Well, another massive news week in financial markets as well as all the crypto headlines that we are going to get through. If you're new to the channel and we have another 2,000 subscribers this week, uh, we start off with the local news in Australia and work our way across the globe with everything that is happening that affects the world of investing in financial markets. And these days, there's a lot of crypto news that is overlapping, particularly with stable coins, which we're going to get into. So look, thank you all for you know joining us on this journey every week. Uh, a lot of family members and friends being recommended to the channel, which is great to hear. The messages that I've got that we have helped some of you prepare, you know, we've been making videos for years about how the financial system works, but particularly uh, the videos we did in the lead up to the crash, I think a lot of people uh, were prepared better than those around them. Uh, it's great to get those messages. And all these people who, you know, vote for us in competitions like this, I didn't even know this was uh, taking place. Uh, we did get voted one of the best podcasts to help you reach your savings goals this year. Uh, and this is in the you know non-crypto traditional world, businessinsider.com.au. So look, it's great that we are getting recognized by mainstream media because a lot of people did used to you know laugh at my uh, work for years and years. And we're certainly climbing our way up the charts. We actually passed one of our mentors, uh, Gary V, this week up to number uh, 18 there. So look, I'm not too fussed about the numbers per se, more so the fact that we can get this message out there to as many people as possible uh, and help them take control of their you know, finances and just understanding because it's something that we don't get taught enough at school. So look, we've got our range of free resources over on the website, nuggetsnews.com.au. If you want to learn about this, if some of the words I say are confusing you, we've got a glossary. We really are trying to cover all bases for you guys. Uh, and particularly, you know, a big thank you to our sponsors. Um, FTX is a place where you can you know, link your Aussie dollar bank account and buy your first Bitcoin, Ethereum, the most common coins. But a lot of people want to know how they can get into, you know, US dollars, which is very easy to do on on FTX, they've got their gold uh, pegged tokens as well. A lot of you I know want exposure to gold and for the more advanced traders, um, I've done tutorials on how to use this exchange, how to use leverage, how to use Bitcoin options to hedge. And I'm gonna be doing a tutorial on the quant zone uh, as well as those move contracts uh, that I know plenty of you love and we've traded a lot uh, in our group. So look, in regards to that group, 25 new members this week, special thanks to you guys. None of this would be possible for myself and the team to produce you know so much content for you every day i know you guys are loving the the daily updates from me and being able to have these discussions in depth and a lot of people tell me that their friends and family work colleagues aren't interested in these topics so being able to dive in and talk about property talk about you know stocks crypto whatever it is um, and bounce ideas off people with a range of experience levels uh, you know it really has been awesome to watch this all grow Okay, let's get into the local news. And you know, the stats out this week from Australia told us that we'd actually added 6,000 jobs in March. So I think this data was up until the second or third week. Even that surprised me a little bit. And uh, CoreLogic is telling us that house prices are still going up. So look, I'm not believing these numbers too much from the mainstream media. We know how bad things are. Uh, this was a little study that came out later on in the week talking about you know 21% of Australians have been laid off. 40% have had reduced income, you know, reduced hours. You know, everything is bad. We know the stats. You guys don't need me to tell you. So I don't believe that things are as great as those numbers that came out this week. Uh, when China sneezes, we catch a cold. Sure enough, China's economy shrank for the first time since 1976. So if you think that Australia is going to just be past this and everything's going to be back to normal in a couple of weeks... Um, unfortunately, I just don't see that playing out at all. I think this is one of those moments in history where we'll look back and a lot of things are going to change, uh, even once we get on top of the, the virus. Now, a number of struggling businesses can't afford to wait for the job keeper. And we know this is going to take weeks and weeks and businesses don't have that sort of cash on hand just to keep all that revenue um, you know, covered in the time being. So that is the reality. Australia has done a better job than other countries, though. I, I will say after being a bit slow to act, hopefully we can do enough to support these businesses. But there are concerns that the money is not getting 
to where it's needed still. A lot of business loans and people trying to refinance being rejected because banks have tightened up You know how easy they're going to give out these credits. A lot of mortgage brokers are telling me that they've been told, you're not allowed to lend to anyone in tourism, hospitality, if they work at an airline. So how are you meant to get money? Or as a business, are you really going to borrow money even though there's more loans available if you're uncertain about the future. These are the gray areas which are going to drag this out for a very long time uh, in my mind. This was a tweet uh, from Melissa Davey. Uh, It went out, uh, got a fair bit of coverage. The big banks are now reducing home loan payments to the minimum amount and they're saying that they're trying to help people. A lot of you will be paying extra. I know we try and pay you know, an extra $100 each, whatever it is you can afford. And if you have no knowledge that this has happened, most people have got their you know, direct debit set on automatic. And I was having this argument with people, if you don't notice that this has happened, that 100 or $200 a week that you and your partner might be paying off above, that actually can translate to an extra $100,000 on a $600,000 loan because you know, you're not aware and you end up paying that extra interest and a total repayments far, far higher. So let me know what you guys think about this in the comments below. Apparently, you can't change this back either. Um, the banks have said until uh, May or some other changes come out, but um, a lot of people are just going to be completely unaware that that has been changed. Now, nearly a million Aussies have tried to withdraw from their super or applied to. So you can withdraw between ten and $20,000. That is going to be a big hit, somewhere between 50 and $100 billion if all those people um, were to get that money out. So is that going to cause the stock market to come down? Probably not the actual number itself, whether or not other people are worried about this and front running and all the other things that cause the stock market to possibly go down as I think it is going to. I don't think it will be necessarily... Uh, just these people trying to withdraw. But we know that the super funds have got so many other problems. So they've been given five days. Uh, That is coming up on um, Monday or Tuesday this week to let people um, have access to their super. And this has been in the headlines because Host Plus, a very popular super fund that's been promoted by a lot of the investment gurus in Australia, they've frozen funds, told people you're not even allowed to sell bad luck, you've got to ride the market down. And that's because they've stuffed these funds with a liquid assets in the property market, um, all these investment trusts, that sort of thing, that there's no buyer at the moment. And that's what we're going to see when we get to the US news. So this was a chart from NAB talking about the average time it takes for employees uh, and unemployment to return to the pre-recession levels. And I definitely think we are going into a recession. So on average here, we've got seven years for a recession and 13 years for a depression. And that is for unemployment to get back to the level it was beforehand. So it changes over time, but um, yeah, even as in the 1990s, it was still 14 years. So this isn't really something you can say, well, that, that was just a long time ago. It's actually very relevant. So these V-shaped recoveries that people are talking about doesn't look like it's going to happen. We've seen Singapore come out and talk about no overseas travel and they're going to keep their borders shut for at least a year and Australia have followed suit here. So you know, forget about going to the MCG concerts and whatnot, even overseas travel until 2021. That's from the health chief. Now, I'm a little bit more optimistic if we can get on top of this and get those numbers really low. Um, I think there's other developments being made, which I'll get into. But um, look, I'm very hopeful that we don't have to wait that long to go out to a sporting match or a concert. This was some great charts from our friends over at the Australian Citizens Party. Uh, They put out a YouTube video every week. Um, I recommend you check that out. But this is basically the beds uh, per thousand in hospitals. And you know, a few years ago, it was up around eight in the public system, and that's dropped right down, public and private, to around four. So this is why we need to keep the curve low. Uh, I know people are still comparing this to the flu. It's simply not the case when you look at the number of deaths uh, per day. And you can't argue with the fact that hospitals in the cities that are affected are overrun past their capacity, and that's what we need to prevent As you just saw, if we have a high number of people that are sick, we simply can't deal with it. And that's when everything uh, gets worse. Australian GDP, look, we made a documentary about this a year ago for you guys. We spoke all about how all this money's been going into the wrong uh, parts of our economy, Um, you know, flooding into housing and not lending to businesses 
uh, as the banks have been doing into mining and whatnot. Uh, and it's just simply not enough to hold out our economy because we don't manufacture enough these days. So look, the Prime Minister is already talking about the big changes that are going to need to take place to pay off all this debt and stimulus. I won't be worrying about that too much at the moment. We need to make sure that we handle this as best as we can. And, you know, Then we can worry about that uh, later on. But yeah, you're going to hear a lot of debate. This is going to be a huge political issue. Labor have come out and spoke about the high-speed rail as part of their pandemic recovery. And I don't know about you guys, but whenever I hear this, I think of you know, the Simpsons singing the monorail song. It seems to pop up every few years in Australia that we're going to build a, a high-speed uh, train. Now, some really positive news that's come out is that antibody study actually found that uh, a lot of people, 50 or 100 times um, more people than we know at the moment that have been tested, have had exposure to the virus and have some form of antibodies. Now, this is only one study. We need to do more research, but if this is the case, yes, percentage-wise, it shrinks that fatality number. But as I said, it's still the absolute number of people that are dying and overrunning the healthcare system each day uh, that we need to make sure that we get on top of. But um, in terms of the treatments, we did have a stock market you know, real rally when the study came out about Gilead saying that really promising results, uh, but they actually poured water on that the following day. Uh, saying that, yeah, it's a little bit mixed and not statistically significant at the moment. Uh, depends on other treatments. And again, we need to do more research. We can't just say that, yes, this worked because other countries have had really bad results, particularly with uh, hydroxychloroquine in terms of um, you know causing issues in the heart, the liver, even the nervous system. So these are the things that we need to do the longer term studies because we don't want everyone getting sick from something else if we dose everyone with a, a, a medication. Okay, so live updates. Yes, deaths topped 160,000. Singapore has had a record number of cases and these guys were the you know example of how to flatten a curve. And sure enough, this is their second wave, a record number of new cases. So when I see... In the United States, you know, people bustling to get everything open again and Trump talking about, you know, May, this is the second wave that I don't think they're really acknowledging yet. And some countries haven't even had their first wave yet. So this is total global deaths still growing, still exponential growth. Uh, It's the countries like Africa that are just starting to hit those numbers where it's becoming significant because it hasn't run through there yet. They didn't have as many international travelers and you know bring it back into the country as we saw in Australia, for example. Now, we've got uh, these, you know, a lot of theories going around. You guys know that I'll stay open-minded to all these theories, but I'm going to wait for more evidence to come out. Uh, but this is a reputable source, I guess you'd say, the, the doctor who discovered HIV, um, coming out and saying that he does think there's enough evidence that some of the DNA that's been sequenced is man-made or has been put there in a way that we shouldn't have that sequence in the genome naturally occurring. But again, this isn't my absolute area of expertise. You know, nature does have these natural defects and mutations. So, There's going to be plenty of research done on this, and even Australian researchers are sequencing this genome. If it does turn out that this is the case, then let's deal with it at that time. And and there certainly would be serious repercussions if that turns out to be true. Now, China have turned around and retaliated in all these words that Trump's throwing around and different political leaders and you know the supply chains are breaking down. But uh, yeah, tougher rules on exports, particularly freezing the critical medical goods that are destined for the US. That's probably the clearest thing uh, that's come out of all this so far. Uh, test kits, who can manufacture what, but particularly medicines themselves. Uh, we know that India are really cracking down on their exports of hydroxychloroquine. Every country wants this at the moment. Uh, This was an interesting article about the history of it. Uh, Some of you will be aware that uh, quinine is in uh, tonic water. Now, not at any levels that it's going to have any medical effects, but uh, yeah, it is interesting, um, the history behind quinine and the production of hydroxychloroquine in India. Now, speaking of all these different articles, Facebook have decided that they are going to police and start warning people who like or react to certain stories that they consider fake news. So once again, these big tech giants are all powerful. These are leaked images of the Google debit card. So we've seen Apple Pay, Facebook Coin, 
and sure enough, Google are getting involved now. So those FANG stocks have actually been surging. Uh, we'll get to that article a little bit later, but uh, they just want to become all powerful. And I did a little bit of a write-up about how I think um, it's going to play out with them getting into the world of banking and finance. So multiple US protests. People are sick and tired of this lockdown. The thing that worries me here is that a lot of Americans that are now out of work um, they haven't got the financial support that's been more easy to roll out in smaller countries like Australia. So there's going to be this big crackdown, monitoring everything we do. They are going to come for those protests hard. And the people that protest are people that are more likely going to push back. We saw a lot of um, guns. Um, I tweeted about the rules. I, weren't, I wasn't aware that you were allowed to take even rifles and that to protest and generally out in public in the US. So let's hope that um, you know temperatures don't flare too much there. But Jesse Powell, CEO of Kraken, saying that the best thing about all this is once you enforce the wearing of face masks, it's actually going to be a lot harder for them to track all this facial recognition technology. So uh, interesting. I'm not sure if they can still get enough data points from your eyes and your other features, even if you've got a mask on or not. But into the actual US data, um, sure enough, indicators crash most in 60 years. We know how bad it is. Another 5 million jobless claims, that's 22 million in the past few weeks. These are the sort of people that are waiting on the $1,200 check from the US. Now, have a look at these different sectors. Food and beverage stores with people stocking up on food is up, but just about everything else is down. And to be honest, I'm surprised it's not down more than that when you see restaurant bookings that are down 100%. It's all these little niche industries that we don't really think about, and they're actually quite big on a global scale. So, you know, flower industry, $8.5 billion in trade, and all these flowers are just going to waste. Um, as taboo as it is, you know, the adult entertainment industry, um, sex workers, that sort of thing, you know, demand social distancing. And in some countries, this is the difference between putting food on the table for your family or not. 50 million pints of beer are going down the drain in uh, the UK unless pubs reopen. So it's just all these different industries that don't come to mind that it's just a huge strain on a lot of small businesses a lot of the time and individuals that aren't getting that support they need. So it was great to hear the USDA wanting to purchase these different farm products for food banks. That's exactly what I said last week. I don't want to see this, you know, this milk being poured on paddocks. I want to see it being given to starving hungry kids if they don't even have food, you know, three milkshakes a day, whatever it is, guys, let's get that food to where it's needed for the starving homeless people. Uh, similar in Europe, Car registrations crash most on record. We've seen car sales drop. We've seen huge inventories of used car sales. And we know that all those people had financing. So the record auto loan bubble, trillion dollars of debt in the US that people aren't going to be able to pay. Now, in Europe, it's a little bit harder when you choose who you're going to bail out because all these different countries have got different austerity measures. 65% um, of Greek hotels, they do rely heavily on tourism. Facing bankruptcy as the lockdown continues. Uh, emergency measures in the US. So this is the second wave of proposed changes, You know, another couple of trillion dollars here and there. Uh, this would provide $2,000 of monthly payments to Americans. And I think this is something that is, is more appropriate to the level that people would need to survive because that $1,200 figure you know, $1,200, this is going to take weeks. Some people that don't qualify for the electronic deposit are going to wait weeks to get this mailed to them. And at that stage, some people have been out of the job for two or three months. $1,200 to live off for 10 weeks when you might not have work for the next six months. You know, this is where civil unrest is really going to break out um, if people don't have food on the plate. Small business rescue loan is out of money. So this hit its limit very quickly. And the stats that I read were shocking. Um, I can't remember the exact number of businesses, but compared to the number that applied, it was a very, very small percentage. So very few of these actual small businesses that need this money got it and it already ran out of money. So I hope they do increase that amount. But once again, why are we so focused on the top end of town getting bailed out? Uh, this was a great chart showing the cash buffer that different industries have. Um, and you know the vast majority of people don't have a month's worth of money on hand to keep paying the bills, but particularly paying their staff. 
that's where we spoke about at the start of the video about even the job keeper in Australia, let alone in the US, where they're still trying to sort this out. Um, you know, these cash buffers. Even the big companies apparently have got no money and need to be bailed out within a few days of the shutdown. So this is, as I spoke about before, the top five companies in the US have never made up a greater percentage of the S&P 500. So 19%, all that money is flowing into big tech stocks. Uh, I actually don't think that that makes a lot of sense when you see the amount of ad revenue that has dropped. For those of you that don't know, advertising on Facebook has become a lot cheaper because less people are doing it. Uh, you know, So to get the same eyeballs, you're paying a lot less. So I think... For, um, Earnings season is coming up next few weeks in the US and wouldn't be surprised at all to see huge revenue drops from some of the big tech companies, even though they've actually been surging and um, some of them have even passed their old record highs. They're struggling off uh, the pandemic altogether. So question from Robobank. This is the question that governments face. Can you basically pay everyone almost like a universal basic income? Can you pay them to do nothing at the same time that we're watching stock markets hit all-time highs? Now, this is something that I thought about a couple of weeks ago, and I've been working on a write-up for our members about this. It's very important to acknowledge that the real economy and the stock market are now parallel universes, okay? And maybe we do face this reality where so much money has been printed and we go into this inflationary spiral that stocks and assets go up at a time when unemployment is 20 or 30%. And when we look at the fiscal response as a percent of GDP, uh, the United States is right up there. Australia's middle of the range as well. But uh, some other countries like Japan, you know, they've been buying up every government bond and buying up ETFs forever, so it doesn't matter to them as much. Uh, but this is huge in terms of what governments have had to uh, print to rescue economies. Now, for central banks like the Fed are saying that they're going to cut back the amount of QE that they're doing. This is insane. $15 billion a day. <laughs> cutting it by 50%. But you guys know that anytime the Fed say they're going to cut back any of that stimulus, that, that heroin that markets are addicted to, we normally have a downturn. So that is something that I will be watching there. And I want to share this article. I tweeted during the week that I'm old enough to remember that a time when $700 billion of stimulus got hotly debated and it actually got rejected initially in the House before being uh, passed. But... You know, these days it's two trillion here. I think we're up to six trillion. Another two trillion proposed, and it's going to Wall Street like there's this urgency. You know, do airlines, planes disappear if a company goes bankrupt? No, their assets sit there. They might gather dust for a bit, but a company is just a name in a registry. You know, someone else will come along and start those business and buy those assets and employ the staff again. Why are we so fixated on bailing out the big end of town that have already been doing all these buybacks and everything when it's almost like the average little guy has been forgotten about where they should be the priority? And this is where social unrest is going to escalate in, in my mind. When we start hearing stories about banks seizing um, the relief payments for you know people in debt, but particularly veterans, for example... When the money hits the bank in the US, or I'm not even sure if this is the same in Australia, if you owe money to people, they can take that money out. So you might be at home starving and waiting weeks to get this check and you don't get it because you are in financial hardship already. And uh, let me know down in the comments, um, particularly in the US, if you heard stories about this or how it all works. I'm really keen to hear about that. So look, the Fed have been very busy here. They've already injected 2.7 trillion of liquidity into global markets. I love that word liquidity. Basically, they're just buying and they don't want to let anything ever go down. Uh, this is the Fed's balance sheet. Crazy that's over 6 trillion, um, but if you have a look at the percentage move compared to back in the GFC, it's not as big as a percentage move, but uh, they're still in firefighting mode. That's really important to acknowledge. And unlike back then, the government has really picked up the slack. You know, government spending trillions as well as the Fed spending trillions. Uh, final slide here, if it is going to work for me, uh, that I did want to show you was foreign bank reserve. So they've drawn an extra $7.7 billion from liquidity and these swap lines. Now... I think the demand that is needed is in the trillions. You know, we're talking ten to twenty trillion dollars that the Fed is trying to get into. You know, foreign, uh, foreign accounts there, and that's where we hear this huge demand for U.S. dollars. Now, half the world has asked the IMF for a bailout, according to them. 
They are going to fire a lot of money uh, to these developing countries, but it's not really a bailout. It's a loan. You're still putting these developing countries in debt, and when they fail to pay their debt, they come in and buy up all their assets with money that they printed out of thin air. Now, there's been some awesome articles going around. I did a long video about this last week about all the dollars outside of the US and the huge relationship here with the cryptocurrency space. So the reason that this is important, uh, we're going to get to all the stablecoin news uh, in just a second. But for the first time ever, it's not just the Fed that can move dollars from different countries. We can do that through a crypto app. Now, don't forget, in Europe, there's still 80 banks charging negative interest rates as this crisis deepens. So even people that want to sit in the local currency are being punished. So is there any wonder that everyone is trying to get into the US dollar? Now, the Fed, uh, Kashkari, telling banks to sell $200 billion of stock, you know, try and get up the, the money, the reserves, by selling shares and get ready to weather this storm. Now, a lot of US banks have already set aside billions of dollars. They know that credit losses are coming uh, for the corona recession, as they're calling it here. But really, I mean, they're already getting bailed out. Are they going to sell shares? I, I don't think so. Uh, Bank of Canada, sorry, expecting to buy $200 billion worth of debt. So it's embracing QE. Australia started QE. Australia's already backed off its QE. And I think that's one of the reasons our market is going to keep falling. Uh, but if you look at the percent of assets on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet now as a percentage of GDP, look back in the day in the 40s when gold basically made up the assets of the Federal Reserve. Then we've got different types of securities, you know, the bonds and whatnot, and now we're getting a bit exotic with these other assets. Uh, now, the Fed directly uh, buying those junk bond ETFs and whatnot, um, they've employed BlackRock. But uh, when you just look at this, this balance sheet here and the amount of money printing compared to US stocks, I mean, how can they continually argue that that's not where this money um, is directly going? Really positive step forward that the EU has now uh, prohibited bailed out companies from paying bonuses as well as dividends. I wish we'd do that in Australia um, and in the US. Geez, you're going to face some political backlash from all your donors uh, if you cut out all these bonuses the big execs are paying out. Uh, but buybacks, um, as you can see here, 2020 down the bottom, 81 billion so far. And it's off to a pretty slow start. And hopefully, they get banned and that number stays really low because, you know, up in the last few years, getting close towards a trillion dollars of buybacks that have just propped up shares. And sure enough, they're going to ask for those trillions of dollars to get bailed out when they've been using all that money to buy back their shares. So Moody's and these rating agencies are now starting to downgrade all the different CLOs. I've done videos on this. CDOs cause the GFC. We've now got CLOs that are looking like they could cause the next financial crisis and the next leg down market crash. And a lot of these are those bonds that I spoke about in the video last week in the energy sector. So look, the Fed have become the firefighters. I'm trying to put out all these different spot fires everywhere. But uh, yeah, junk bond ETFs, the shorts, the people that are still betting that this is going to go down to an all-time high. And as much as it would make sense, people that have done their fundamental research and that are betting that HYG is going to go down, as I've spoken about, I think that trade has already played out because the Fed are just buying up HYG. BlackRock aren't going to let their own fund go down because they get to print money out of thin air uh, on behalf of the Fed and use all that money. So the sector that is being hit is obviously oil. We saw oil prices fall below $20. That is going to crush all those energy companies that have issued all that debt, as I spoke about in the video. Storage is filling up rapidly. We've got tankers out at sea carrying 160 million barrels. So you see all these big ships that just sit off the off the coast that are full of oil and they've got nowhere to store it on land. So this is why prices are tanking and why certain varieties of oil have now got a negative price because it costs them more to store a barrel of oil um, you know, than to, to keep it themselves. All right, so wholesale gasoline hits 12 cents a gallon in the US. For those of you in Australia, that's actually the equivalent of 5 cents per litre. Wouldn't that be nice to have petrol uh, that low? Robobank come out, another great quote from them, the Fed have carved central planning into the bedrock of the US financial system. So everything has changed in the past couple of weeks. 
nothing has true value anymore. It's a parallel universe. We've got some of these financial planners or experts, advisors, gurus, whatever you want to call them. Look, here's some ETFs that we think that the Fed might buy. So we're buying something because we think someone else might buy it with money they've printed out of thin air. Apparently, that's an investing strategy these days. So Egon von Graes has come out and said that uh, hyperinflationary depression has always been the inevitable game. And that's what I described before. The price of goods is going up. We're experiencing inflation because there's been too much money printed. At the same time, we're in a depression where there's 20 30% unemployment. And that represents the disallocation between the real world and the financial world that the people in the middle that are taking advantage of that, they're the ones that are getting richer. Uh, and once you understand that, you can start to really put all those pieces together in how you're going to invest. Uh, this was Stan Druckenmiller, Ray Dalio, sorry, uh, another great piece of research from him talking about the span of global currency reserves, how long they last. And uh, a lot of people thinking the US's time is going to be up sooner or later, whether or not that comes after the rush to US dollars. At the end of the day, you know, gold is that currency. Once the US dollar starts to inflate, the people are going to turn to. Russia put the foot off the pedal in terms of their gold reserves, but there's plenty of other countries that um, are continuing to add to their stockpiles as these nothing currencies around the world. If you're not a top three currency, you're really worried about what is going to happen to your currency and how you're going to compete. So guys, everything I've spoken about today, um, a lot of those ETFs, if you're going to trade, be aware of the things that I've spoken about. A lot of you want to know how to short the Australian market. Uh, the ticker is AUS20. Uh, you can do all that on eToro. I am looking to short the US markets because it's had a bigger bounce. I'm also looking to deploy capital if, if we have this other leg law, which I expect is coming. So I'm not a perma bear. There's going to be a time to buy stocks. Um, yeah, have a practice. They've got that virtual account if you're not um, not familiar with how to trade, but I've done tutorials on how to set stop losses and all that. We're running that $100 Bitcoin bonus for you guys at the moment um, if you do want to sign up with that link below. So let's get into the crypto news now. Craig Wright has dropped his lawsuit against Vitalik Buterin. So good news for Vitalik. I'm not sure if he was too stressed there. Uh, Binance continuing their global push. And this is something that's really important to acknowledge. The number of on-ramps in different currencies is just insane for all these different countries and citizens that are watching their currency being devalued. Uh, next up here for Binance, they announced uh, a new smart contract enabled blockchain or side chain that they're talking about it as. Now, when they came out with their Binance chain, they were talking or everyone was talking about how this was going to be a big rival for Ethereum. And it's been, I'd say, a bit of a flop if you look at the volumes on their decks and whatnot because DeFi has taken off on Ethereum. So look, I'm not sure how this is all going to function. It's going to run in parallel. Let's wait and see. Uh, but I just think Ethereum has that huge head start now that other chains are, are finding out. We've got plenty of good chains that are about to uh, release as well. And you know, Binance is just another chain there in terms of smart contracts. Record profits, $52 million, another $3 million BNB burnt there. Very cool stuff for Binance holders, and it's had a pretty good run lately. Uh, Binance staking has been one of the reasons that I think they've become really popular for people and Coinbase are obviously looking to add all their different stakings as well. Polkadot is going to be a rival for Ethereum, a very strong team that's launching soon and Coinbase Custody, I'm sure Binance as well, are going to offer 20% returns for staking your Polkadot there. A cool tweet from Brian Armstrong about the $1,200 stimulus and the amount of purchases and deposits that they saw around the $1,200 level. <laughs> so very obvious. I know a lot of you are going to do this in Australia as well. If you're well off and you know this bonus deposit money, people are going to buy some Bitcoin, buy some gold, uh, their favorite stocks maybe, but um, that's what this money is going towards if you don't need it desperately. A lot of US banks actually couldn't handle the loads of all these different stimulus payout uh, demands. And look, I've been on record saying I wish they had have done this through an app and use a US dollar stablecoin. Probably would have been better to do all that. 
such a huge overlap now between the banking system uh, and the world of finance as well as stable coins. Aussie crypto unicorn raising 160 million uh, with some of the big four banks backing. So this is Air Wallex. I'm gonna have to have a bit more of a look into this. Basically, a, uh, I believe it's a cloud-based uh, software partnering up with RippleNet, or sorry, RippleNet as a member of Air Wallex. But um, yeah, this is one that I do wanna get on the channel. If you've got a link to the team guys, yeah, put me in touch and I wanna know uh, what they're doing and how it differs from a lot of the other um, similar projects out there. Now, this is something that I've been talking about for years that all these energy companies, anyone that's mining oil or gas, even renewable energy, if it's going to waste, you should be mining Bitcoin and at least getting some money back on that energy. So Marty Bent put out a piece about a lot of these oil companies, particularly in the US at the moment, uh, they should be mining Bitcoin to get a little bit of extra on the side. And I completely agree. And I'd love to see it go renewable, but we also hate to see energy go into waste. China's digital yuan apparently is set to go live in May for government employees. We've also seen some testing in certain uh, sectors in China. I think it was uh, Agricultural Bank of China that was testing this out. So here's some screenshots comparing it to Alipay that's used pretty widely in China. So this is the DCEP uh, wallet or Decept, uh, Deception as it's been known in China. All right, so in terms of the stablecoin world, it is receiving pushback. The Financial Stability Board recommended effectively uh, regulation that would ban st um, stable coins. I did a deep dive into this with David from Pegnet. Look, some people said this video was about Pegnet and it was about Pegnet in the first half, guys, because Pegnet is a stablecoin project and David has read the full recommendations here. So look, I just found that a bit frustrating when people are complaining about this video was about Pegnet and stablecoins when that's literally what I had in the, in the tile, guys. Um, this is free content. Um, always open to feedback, but uh, yeah, I don't think it was a misrepresentation as some people were, were telling me. I was trying to fool them into watching a video, whereas it was literally one of my favorite conversations, particularly the second half. Uh, but anyway, Libra have done a bit of a 180 and they have confirmed their shift to a multi-currency model rather than that basket of currencies because of the pushback they got from regulators. Uh, Rahul, uh, Rahul did tweet this article that I touched on before about the euro dollar. So the explosion of US dollar stable coins is now a better option than the central banks in terms of their ability to move US dollars around the world or the individual that wants US dollars can download the Coinbase app, the Binance app, you know, in Australia, CoinSpot, you name it, anyone can get access to Tether, USDC, or DAI, decentralized stablecoin, Pegnet, Synthetics. There's so many options out there now. And this is where I think the overlap is so much in terms of the potential and scope. Tether and stablecoin values are up, I think, around um, six or seven trillion dollars. A lot of these transactions, we saw Ethereum reach parity with Bitcoin in terms of the value of all the transfers happening on the blockchain. And that's because 90% uh, of these stable coins are now trading on um, over on Ethereum these days where it was all really tether on the Omni layer on top of Bitcoin You know, only a year ago. So look, I think that that Tether could really climb and even pass maybe the market cap of who knows, Ethereum or, or Bitcoin. Now, eventually that money is better off going into Bitcoin or Ethereum or something that has a fixed supply instead of being pegged to a currency that's having trillions uh, printed of it. But for the time being, this is solving a real world problem of the shortage of global dollars. Okay, so we've got the test nets coming out. Uh, great work from the team at Prismatic Labs. That is all functioning. Have a play around with that if you are a developer, but people have started depositing their 32 ETH into the new ETH 2.0 beacon chain. If you're an ETH holder, there is nothing you have to do yet. There's gonna be lots of scams out there trying to get you to deposit your 32 ETH and promising early access. It's not there yet for the average user or investor. There's nothing different you need to do. We've had the first uh, loan issued with an Ethereum domain name as the collateral. So this is where I get very, very excited. 
watching the world of DeFi explode, and we've got Ethereum backing a lot of these assets. But now we can start to use things like crypto.com, for example. That that Ethereum domain name or crypto.eth, that might be really valuable, just like you know, Facebook.com. The domain name is really valuable. Someone has to buy that. Now you can put up other assets like a domain name or tokenized real estate as collateral for different DeFi products. That's very, very powerful once we can integrate the real world uh, with the DeFi world. This is where I spoke about the disruption from DeFi. It is taking a huge chunk. It's gonna eat Wall Street's lunch. This was everything from dark pools to finance. We spoke about this with uh, Lon Wang from Republic Protocol. A bit of a tongue twister there, uh, but again, one of my favorite interviews that we did last week. I think I covered Pydow last week, but this is the newest way to build crypto index funds in an actual token yourself. So you can design tokens with different percentage weightings and the smart contract will spit out a token at the end of that process that you can sit on your ledger. So these are called Pies. One of the first Pies that they're building was a Bitcoin Pie. Uh, and one of the segments of the Pie did actually get um, targeted and, and drained. And the team put out a bit of an announcement. There were some safety measures in place. Um, this was probably one of the better outcomes in terms of the measures they had to make sure it wasn't too bad. But uh, yes, we are very early on. Uh, very cool stuff from Balancer in terms of enabling you to build those pies and, and whatnot as well. Soon they're going to be on Uniswap. I'll talk about these more in future. But um, look, it is just awesome watching how far we've come in the world of DeFi. There's no surprise that uh, you know Polychain Capital, these DeFi alliances are just growing in terms of the investors and the corporations, companies that are getting behind DeFi these days. I did say last year that the copycats were going to come. So we've seen Tron jump into the IEO space this week. They're a little bit late there, but uh, this is their new synthetic asset platform called ICOS. And if you think it looks familiar... It is identical to Synthetics Exchange, where they've also, I believe, ripped off or copied the code base. And some people said, well, you know, it's open source software. It's all fair in love and war. But um, let me know what you think of that below. I think Ethereum, Synthetics, and DeFi have got the network effects where this shouldn't be too much of a tra uh, challenger uh, being built on Tron. Andreessen Horowitz, huge fund. They're doubling down another $450 million fund focusing on Bitcoin, ETH, DeFi. I think this is the, I guess, the world we're living in at the moment where we've seen the wealthy buying up a lot of assets during the stock market crash. They've still got a lot of money. They are going to swoop in and buy all the assets that the little guy on the street is being forced to sell. And I think the next run we have in Bitcoin is going to come from the middle and upper class. It's not going to be a retail run like 2017. So when you see Grayscale, these investment funds, having another record quarter, $500 million of inflows, um, record amount flowing into Ethereum as well, that money is out there and it is going into crypto. The SEC have allowed another hedge fund uh, direct access to the CME futures. This is the stuff that I don't like. Cash settled products, I love it when people are actually buying up and pushing up you know, the amount of real Bitcoin that is hodled away off supply. That is what we want to see. So finally, some um, bits of data from our friends over at Sentiment, the number of active addresses. We, we can see that this, again, is bullish divergence, uh, suggesting that a bull market lies ahead. Social volumes have absolutely exploded since we dropped down to 6,500. All these measures are... You know, looking up, the number of searches for Bitcoin Harvey crossed a record high this week. So people are interested. That hasn't resulted in any price action just yet, but we've still got three weeks or a little bit over three weeks until the actual Harvey. And uh, let's have a look at the Bitcoin price. I've had these three areas of resistance on my chart for a number of weeks now, and these are the weekly resistance levels. This was always going to be a tough zone to get through. Now, last week, we had this bearish week, and I probably said that it was going to roll over, but look, we, did, we didn't we did roll over. That's a real positive. Um, the fact that we've been able to just sort of grind our way through this heavy resistance all week. And every time it looked like we, we might have rolled over, 
the buyers stepped in. So this is all pretty positive when maybe I, like everyone else, was too bearish with my targets. What I will say is that we have to be aware of the correlation and the stock market has continued to grind higher as well. We're looking at the 50% retracement. This for me is an ideal entry for a short. For me personally, you know, you guys have to always do your own research. But if this rolls over, that is when we have to wait and see if Bitcoin rolls over too. It doesn't mean anything until Bitcoin gets above here, closes above here, this big resistance, and it breaks its correlation to the stock market. That is what I need to get really bullish uh, about the next few weeks and months. Ethereum did have a stronger week than Bitcoin. That's really clearly reflected in the ETH Bitcoin ratio. Uh, I think I spoke about this as well, saying that as long as we hold this 61% retracement that we dipped into, um, I'm very bullish and I do think that alts could actually outperform. We've seen the Bitcoin dominance actually finally lose that really long-term uptrend on the weekly here. So it's got uh, 12 hours or so to close and rescue like we did last week to close above this area. But if we don't, um, that would suggest that alts are going to outperform uh, Bitcoin. Doesn't mean that Bitcoin can't go up and have a tremendous run. But yeah, I do think that could possibly a sign of the interest in ETH and DeFi and you know Binance having some good news and whatnot. Let's wait and see. You guys know that I'll do daily updates for you. We've got all those free resources for your friends and family. Don't forget that $100 sign-up bonus uh, in the description down below. Uh, we've got a double discount with FTX for you guys as well. And finally, I will just mention that... Um, a big thank you to everyone that is joining the group. And again, those conversations, absolutely top notch. We're all learning together. The team have been creating fantastic research for you guys. And um, I think gold and silver, you know, the macro economy, there's never been more opportunity that's lying ahead of us. And hopefully I can help you uh, build wealth on that journey and let you know what I'm doing as well. So guys, smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, share this video with your friends and family, and I'll talk to you again soon. Cheers.